Um, so I was doing a bit of research, Luca. Um, our last show was way back in 20 May, the 7th, I think. Uh, let's get this right. The, our last show was May the 7th, 2014. So wow. in 2014, the iPhone 5 was the thing to have. Um, what else happened in 2014? Who won the world? Who won the worlds in 2014? Oh, 2014. Um, I don't know. I know 2013 was Bora. Um, can't remember. Probably should have done a bit more. It was before so Sorrento. Sorrento. Sorrento was 2014. is a bit of a blank. Right. Anyway, I should know. You should know. <laughs> um, anyway, so 2020. Mm. Um, Mothcast is back. It is. It is back. I think most of our audience wouldn't have um, probably been born by we didn't know who the we were doing it before. Well, yeah, that's most of our audience, a problem. Most of our audience wouldn't know what Mothcast is. No, no. So, um, but no, it's good to be back. I think. I think we'll um, try to be a bit more regular. <laughs> I think that's the message. But um, we enjoy doing it, so so that's why we wanted to um, continue on. But there's plenty to talk about. I mean, it's been five years. We've got um, lots to cover. Um, but I think we will probably mostly focus on what's been happening at the um, 2019 Moth Worlds in Perth. 2014th Moth World Champion was Nathan Outerage. Ah, there you go. Where was that at? Is that Garden? Um, no. Um, that was somewhere. Hailing. The Hailing, Hailing Worlds, Island. The Lighter Worlds of Hailing. The ones I missed. <laughs> That's why I don't remember. That's why I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, Perth Worlds, what, what an awesome event, Bruce. You, you followed it from Sydney. Um, yes, unfortunately. I was in Perth. And? <laughs> it wasn't a great regatta for me. I mean, I broke my gear entry, which kind of ended my regatta pretty quickly. Um, I think I was going okay before then, uh, sort of just just in the top 20, I guess. But um, but yeah, look, lack of boat preparation, Bruce will do that soon, and lack of sailing as well. So, um, But my focus was really not on my sailing. It was more on the foils and, uh, and the business itself. So I think that's probably the biggest difference I think, to be honest, now for, for Luke Adamic in 2020 versus Luke Adamic in 2014. Yeah, 2014, I was just um, full time, time in furniture sales. and You were an amateur. I was an amateur. Now I'm defined as a professional because I've got a falling business. But um, yeah, lots has changed, hasn't it? Well, Not so much for you because um, you haven't changed careers, but I have. <laughs> no, 2014. Well, yeah. So since oh, it's old news, but you know, new boat, that sort of stuff. I have changed companies. Actually, I haven't changed yeah, careers, but, yeah. but changed companies. Um, my son's just finished high school mm. already, so a lot's gone on um, in, in, in real life or outside um, since 2014. But yeah, it's um, so what 2014 Nathan Outerage, so one in uh, Mark II. Um, in Mark II, yeah. That was probably the start of the era, era as well. So. Well, this is part of the dominance, you know, they've been dominating for seven years. I think it's seven successive um, world championship wins for the Mark II. And um, it's obviously changed in the last three years or four now, now that um, Slingsby's won the last one. So it's four wins for the exercise. Now, when you throw out a number like that, are you sure it's not five? I'm, I, I don't know either. Uh, I think it's four. I'm pretty sure it's four, but it's pretty dominant at the moment after the exercise. If, if we did get that wrong, sorry, Simon. Uh, anyway, it's been, it's been winning, clearly. Uh, and Slingsby was, um, yeah, absolutely brilliant in both. So when you say Slingsby, of course, talking about Tom, Tom. Slingsby. Tom. And I think this might be the most dominant one. You know, I can't remember a regatta where somebody dominated this much. You know, it's, we've had the days of Rowan Veal, we had the days of Mark Thorpe. They were pretty dominant in their day. But I have to admit, to win, what is it, uh, 13 out of 14, no, 12 out of 13 races that counted towards the regatta is pretty amazing. I think the historically, when people have won and won so dominantly, it's been, I'm, I'm thinking back to the 1990s, like when, when Emmett won, Emmett was when Emmett, Emmett won like a gajillion championships on the trot. Generally then we'd sell one race a day and it would be five-ish races plus the yeah. invitation race. So it'd be five long Olympic style courses. So yeah. nautical mile, so, you know, nautical mile triangle, nautical mile winter yeah. return, nautical mile triangle, so a total of, um, what's that, uh, eight nautical miles in total, so long and low riding, yeah. so long, long, hard days. Um, and yeah, I think back then you would have definitely seen that level of dominance, but I think the big difference now is we're doing four races a day. Yeah, and also what's changed is the class, while it was competitive back then, it wasn't as competitive. You know, you kind of had top, you know, 10 guys maybe, they were, they were quite dedicated to it. Now you've got top 30 almost selling full time. You know, there's, there's a big number of people that are doing this um, semi-professionally. 
and certainly in the lead up to, to Perth, um, in Sydney, there would have been a group of maybe five or six guys that were up sailing just about every day. And that sort of um, dedication to the, to the sport we haven't seen in a long time either. So it makes it even more impressive because it's not like you've got one professional guy sailing against a bunch of amateurs that aren't training, which might have arguably happened back in the day a little bit more. Yeah. Um, now you've got a big group of people doing um, all they can to win and develop their equipments. And, and the big battle you know, that, that always happens was actually before the regatta um, in terms of boat development and trying to get an edge on your competitors. And that's, that's where it became you know, fairly clear that Tom had a bit of an edge in the, in the fresher stuff. Um, it would have been interesting to see what, what would have been the outcome had it been a little bit lighter. Um, I think there was a few other guys that were fairly... But it's Perth, Luca. <laughs> it is Perth. And this is the thing, you know, we... It seems to only be either very windy or not windy at all. So, um, you know, the sort of 10 to 15 knot range that you'd expect from a typical regatta, we didn't really get a lot of. Uh, we probably had it at the bottom of the course, big differences between the pressure and the top and the bottom of the course. But ultimately, um, you know, it was a fairly consistently fresh regatta. Um, but anyway, Bruce, um, you know, we want to talk about the podium. So clearly Slingsby, very dominant, very fast, sailing very well, you know, starting brilliantly to get out and, and, and lead. You know, quite often it was, um, you know, his lead would be quite significant by the top mark. And, and the key to that from what I sort of saw was getting a really good start and going left first. You know, if there was, obviously there was a big left-hand bias and he'd get there first. Um, you know, he'd start close to the pin ends, have a great start and just put the afterburners on. You know, he was pretty unstoppable. By the time you do that first tack, he was gone. And then downwind, um, definitely a bit of a speed advantage as well in being able to just drive hard for longer and, um, and extend by the bottom mark. And um, yeah, pretty dominant. I think the one thing that um, you can see in the armchair from the other side of the country, or the other side of the world for that matter, is, um, sorry, segue. Got to love this drone coverage. The amount of <laughs> the amount of um, the amount you can see. Well, actually, I do and don't. Like, I think I, I think Bo Outerich does probably the best coverage of the moss that we, we get out there. Um, and the, the thing about the drone coverage is, particularly when they're running the top mark and you're looking down the course, you can actually just see what what you can't see on the boat, yeah. which is see where all the pressure is. Yeah. And so for me, that's where you could really see where Tom's speed's coming from. And to be honest, I don't know if, how much was coming from the boat. But to me, it's all all coming between main sheet and tiller. And you could literally just see once he's got the lead, he's just oh look, there's a gust, and Tom goes right for it. And look, the breeze is coming out. You could just see he just picks and goes. Yeah, I think mean, it's a combination of things. You know, it was. Look, he, he was fast, you know, boat speed wise as well, definitely a bit of an edge. And I think that came through probably a rig development more than anything else. I know that the standard pictures that, you know, it's a standard north sail off the shelf, but not really. Um, you know, how these things work. It's also what and, you do with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, the sail, the rig package worked beautifully. CST rig, north sail, set up really well, uh, developed, you know, to the last minute. And um, so I think definitely that, that gave him a bit of an edge. But having said that, Rob Greenhouse had the same sail, and so did um, uh, Steve Thomas. They were three of the latest generation sails. You know, I bought mine probably two weeks before the event, uh, along with Tom Burton and a couple of other guys, and our sails weren't the same. You know, we, we weren't, we didn't have the deck sweeper development to the point of the, of the latest sails that the other three guys had. So there's definitely, definitely a bit of an edge in that. Um, foils, uh, hull, you know, platform itself, um, you know, the, the falls that Slingsby used were slightly tweaked, you know, fixed steeps slightly. Um, I'm not sure if the main was cut down. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so fast fall package, um, service from Simon Maguire, there was, there was second to none, you know, but they did change the wing bar, uh, out of wing bar just before the last race or before the last day. Um, so there is a bit of maintenance that people probably wouldn't have uh, realized in the background. And then um, on top of that, you've got a 90 plus kilo guy in 20 plus knots that we got most, most days, which goes a long way. And, and I think that's the difference between probably Tom Burden in third and Kyle and, and um, Tom Slings being first and second. Um, that extra 10, 15 kilos, when you're going upwind and trying to do 20 knots, it, it does pay off. And then fat on top fast. of that, fat is, fast. fat is fast. And this was a heavy regatta. So that's sort of attribute number two. And then lastly, I think just Tom spending the time in the boat and just getting most out of it. You know, we sort of hang, a lot of us are hanging on in 20 knots, you know. You've got to be super fit and Tom is super fit. He hikes hard, he plays the main hard and he keeps the boat in the groove for longer than most. 
And I think a lot of the speed is obviously just Tom sounding well. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's really interesting. So you know, um, you know, no lack of credit to Maguire. You know, obviously the package is still quick in the right hands. Um, but yeah, congratulations to Tom. Um, moving down the fleet a bit, Mr. Langford. Langford, yeah, impressive. Not very impressive. Close second, not really, but strong mm, second. Strong second. You know, he looked really good in the um, qualifiers. We all thought mm, Kyle could actually take this out. Um, he had a ton of boat speed um, and sailed well. And again, big guy, 90 plus kilos, sails the boat well, very fit, um, and put in the time before the regatta. And that also contributed to the lot of speed. I think the package itself was potentially, um, in my mind, maybe a little bit better. I think. Um, the air on the beak is pretty sweet and the gains that have been made in that area um, are very good. And I think obviously a good poor package and, and, a, and a good rig from Doyle's. So, which was a little bit flatter than the North. And I think again, that suited the heavy guy, heavy breeze that we got. I suppose that's really, if you're just stepping out of, out of the worlds for a second, then uh, if you look at, I think where we were running back in 2014, very much super stiff masks, like the, I think the Elite 3 was the CST master yeah. at the time. Um, still very much, I think, KA sale, still definitely right up there. Um, I think most people with the moving away from the 10s, I think the 16 um, was probably the, the, the sale from, a, from an Aussie point of view anyway. Um, I think Lennon's um, probably the A3M was really starting to come in. Yeah, um, it was a new thing. So starting yeah. to come at that point. And starting to put that change in to go from a sale, which is primarily relatively flat with a you know, with a, almost, a, almost a single mode, really. I think it's a, a good way to just like, sort of simplify the idea yeah. of ideology around the KA. Um, not a single mode, but you know what I mean. Um, as, as a distinct from the Lennons, which were very much a let it off, really get this huge grunty sale to go yeah, down. Yeah, huge range. I think that's been the development of the sales that we've seen over the years is that you know, the range has just gotten so big now. You've got this super powerful sale when it's light and, and for downwind in, in, in lighter breezes as well that can really flatten off. And, and that's really just kind of gone the opposite way of where it was setting a few years back. The masts have gone softer again. Uh, there's a huge amount of range in the rigs. Um, and, and obviously the development of the deck sweep and the low spec rigs, you know, that's, that's kind of been the biggest um, attribute to speed. So the deck sweeper. So I think in the background, what people may not be aware of is there's been a lot of, um, I don't want to say people, I mean, outside the moth class, there's been a lot of discussion around equipment restriction. Um, some surveys that were done by, the, by all, the, all the class members about do they want unlimited gear, single set, multiple sets, those sorts of things. And I think as someone who you know spends most of his day down the back of the pack um, trying to sail on a budget in the moth class, one thing in my mind, it's this second, the second sail, the second rig, as well as you know the second foil, da, 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 it just almost, for want of a better term, doubles the appendage budget. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I think we were going down a path, I think probably 18 months ago, when deck sweepers were starting to come in where it's like, I know for me, from as a measurer and someone who sort of looks out from that side of the class, sort of thinking around some alarm bells going off, as in, um, I'm gonna have to have two rigs because the deck sweeper was shown to have a clear advantage. And I think two years ago, it was probably 18 up was when it had yeah. a really clear advantage, but we weren't sealing them to the deck yet because we were still running the classic yeah. boats where most boats still had compression struts. The, 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 yeah. I think the exosets were starting to sort of come in with some of the compression strutless, compression strutless boats. Um, so that's definitely the direction that we were. I think fast forward to 2020, um, I think that's all changed now. Yeah, massive, um, massive gain. Oh, and, and coming back to the third guy, because, you know, just to sort of round that off, and um, development that he's put in with um, Andrew Chapman of, of um, Chaps Sales. Or the third guy being? Uh, Tom Burton. Right. So Tom, Tom put in a ton of time with, with um, uh, Andrew with Chapo on, on developing his rig. And that's, you know, but it is all heading in the same direction. It's about bringing the rigs down low, um, the, you know, the center of effort down low, sealing onto the deck. Most of the top, you know, probably 20 boats would have had some sort of a deck fairing um, to actually get that end plate effect. And, and then we saw a proper seal where before, you know, there was sort of four deck level. Um, so the new generation of sail is definitely all the way down, deck sealed, extending the, the, the lengths of the deck sweeper, you know, so that you get a longer um, end plate effect. Longer sweep, yep. yeah. So yep. mainstream bridles have come back as a consequence to get that really nice and big. But, you know, also improving the air as you feed the air into the deck, into the deck sweeper panel, so which is quite, quite important. But 
coming back to Tom because we haven't talked about Tom uh, Burton in third place, um, sounded an amazing regatta in a Mark II, which is absolutely not stock standard, um, <laughs> which is probably as far as you can get away from a standard Mark II. But nonetheless, with stock wings, you know, the old wings with um, uh, compression struts um, and low. Yeah. So definitely, you know, I think for Tom, there was definitely a bit of a loss in power through the, the low wings. Um, and, and, you know, didn't he do an awesome job to just be so consistent and come third when I felt that he probably had a slight deficit in speed uh, through the platform, which just wasn't as fast as the, um, the latest um, X7 and the, and the Beakers. And I suppose that's the, it was an interesting tell, I think, when we had a very light day, I think it was the last day before you packed the boat up to go to the Worlds, where um, you were running the, from memory, you were running your Swift Small as well as the North Deck Sweeper as the final system check, yeah. right? Obviously, yeah. results that matter in the club race. It was like, yeah. let's just, this is what I'm going to run at Worlds, let's just yeah. check it. And what I found really surprising is how well that package did right down range to basically yeah. where, where, you know, me. Margin of Me, me with no technique, can't, yeah. couldn't, couldn't take off. Yeah. We, 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 with I think more so the sail. I think the Swift Small, yes, it gets early takeoff. Um, but I would have been quicker on the day had I had the large foil, no doubt. Um, but I think the rigs are far more versatile than foils. You know, the foils are static. You know, you've got X amount of area. You can't really reduce it. You can't change the camber of the foil mid-sailing. You've got the flat, but obviously you can't really modify it. The sail you can. Yeah. You know, the sail's far more versatile. If it's a full sail, you can pull the controls on and get it to be flat. So you've got a little bit more adjustment, and I think the sails are actually going down the range better than the foils. So it is possible, I think, to actually sail with a with a low aspect deck sweeper that seals on the deck all the way from you know five knots to twenty five, and actually get the full benefit at both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Not really possible with foils. I think foils, you know, and as as proven by all other foiling boats out there that are competitive, like the F fifties and whatnot you need multiple sets of foils. You just cannot get away with a large foil when it's windy and you cannot get away with a small foil when it's light. We'll come back to foils in a minute. I just want to finish talk, sort of talking about that, the rig. So I think the point that I was sort of alluding to is that I think the concern that I had around that you have to have two rigs it actually hasn't eventuated, right? It now comes down to as long as you're prepared to get, you know, the, spend the money and get the north and assuming that it lasts. Um, from a materials point of view, um, that probably is the one rig that you can buy. Um, you can probably even afford to buy one rig for most people at that yeah. price because they're, they're, they're Another thing to note is two masts, right? Yeah. You know, people are using two top sections, so that's actually increasing the range of the sail because you've got the stiff tip which you can put in when it slides, get a little bit more depth up high. And um, so that's definitely helping the range. And, and, and that's, uh, that's where CST, how they yeah. really come to the party with yeah. their whole tow pro pack, which is this idea now of not, you can have to buy a stiff mast and a soft mast. They actually are making tips to bases where yes. you can actually choose and customize for your weight yeah, a, a, you know, different parts that you can put together. Yeah, and good thing for a class because you can buy a tip now for, you know, 700 odd Aussie dollars and not have to buy a whole mast should you break one. You know, so there's also the cost benefit of, oh, it's of massive, being able to... It's massive. To, to, so I think I did a rough check and I think if you were to buy the entire pack, all six pieces, yeah. that's still cheaper than one file. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, yeah. rigs, rigs certainly, it's, it's, it's definitely... Um, the range big. And, and I think most of the guys uh, at the regatta, because of the conditions we got, ran only one. And certainly Tom did. Um, you can only register two anyway. I had two masts, two sails, but I didn't touch my um, light wind um, master mm -hmm. sail. So you know, it almost comes down to you'll go back to a spare as a, if you can. If like yeah, you can. and you know, we were talking about this before the show. If you've got four races and the first one's going to be light, well, you can't really rig up for that one. You know, you've got to sort of say, well, I'll, I'll just suffer in the first one. As the breeze builds in the afternoon, I'll be in the right equipment for the next three. So it, it's a brave call to rig up for the conditions you've got. You've get, really got to sort of look what's, what are you going to have in two hours' time and try to get the best of, um, you know, the, the, the overall better. Right, so let's just quickly um, come back and just so things be dominant first. Um, Kyle, you know, dominant second, but a gap <laughs> back to back from first, and then Tom. I think um, I want to say punching above Mark II's weight, not above yeah. Tom's weight, but punching yeah. bringing bring the bar above his weight. So I think in my mind that does two things. One, it sort of cements um, the fact that it just really shows how not irrelevant, but how much the platform. The actual hull shape and those sort of things really don't matter. Aero now is by far more dominant than round or flat. I'm sure, you know, maybe the 
if it was a bit lighter, the um, the Exocet may have a less sticky hull for takeoff. So on a more varied regatta, you'll see more variant. Yeah, particularly as you probably saw the Mantas coming to a little bit higher on the on the, on the lighter day. Um, so that's the one thing that comes to mind. But what I also want to understand is, um, as I've got the four manufacturers sitting right across from the table, um, so things we was running, you know, modified before. Yeah, it's just that small, right? Fixed um, use modified. So yeah. what was number two and number three running? Uh, number two, number three, and number four, incidentally, we're all running Marfords, which is great. So Swift um, Smalls, which, um, which to be honest, um, without trying to sound arrogant, but we knew that that was going to be the fourth place we get it. You know, it, it is the smallest production fall you can buy. Um, you know, that might change, of course. I know that Cookie's been working on some really small falls as well. But as the boats get quicker, the falls are naturally going to get smaller. So when I designed the Swift range, there was always the goal is to have a smaller small and a smaller large than what was the norm, knowing that in a year or two, it's going to, it's going to come into its own. So yeah, uh, 11 out of top 15 had Swift oils and that was, um, that was the fall to have. So there's a bit of difference though in, um, so let me just confirm. So Kyle and um, Tom both ranks with smalls, horizontals. Um, rudders, what rudders were they? Rudders, um, Kyle might have used a new beaker rudder. Yeah. They've come up with a quite a nice looking um, uh, rudder package. Uh, I don't know what size, uh, the one that I had a look at was quite small. I'm not sure if he had the new small one. He does yeah. also have my rudder from memory that he might lose, uh, use when it's a little bit lighter. Yeah. Um, Tom had the full Swift, you know, set up. He had the new uh, vertical as well, which is thinner and shorter cord. I think definitely again in that for him. Um, and uh, Swift uh, large as well that he might have used on one day in the qualifiers from memory, uh, or perhaps the last day. And uh, Swift um, V3 rudder and uh, an Exocet modified Exocet vertical, so he didn't really run. You know, there's, there is a slight issue with modified rudder, modified as in lengthened. So, you know, I think the Mark II rudders are definitely too short the way they currently are, the 2.3s. Because the gantry is quite high up on the boat too, isn't it? The gantry is quite high. The 2.4 Mark II verticals were 30 mil longer, but the new 2.4 rudders did not get any longer when the verticals got longer. Yeah. And they were borderline too short already, you know. Um, so in my view anyway, but so I think that become, you know, that is a bit of a um, area that, that certainly Tom and I discussed and we talked about what kind of length we could go. For me, it was a, it was just good to see the benefit of going longer. So we went adding the longer. So I think the, um, just for people that aren't aware, so both Lucas and my boat being complete custom one-off boats, I know when I built my gantry, I basically designed it to become as low as possible yeah. you know, on the boat, and that yours is the same sort of thing, same on the water water water, yeah. to get that little bit of extra rudder. Um, and the reason for that is because there is definitely a relation of not wanting to carry too much. If your rudders, if your the length of your centerboard and rudder aren't optimized relative to each other, you'll carry too much of one Absolutely. or not enough of the other. Yeah. It's a compromise. And look, the idea of, I mean, not that other people have followed, but the idea of the low gantries was that you also reduce the, the torsional moment on the gantry itself. So because it is lower by 100 mil, that actually equates to quite a lot of um, load. How, how did that work out for you, though, Luca? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's the bit that failed, <laughs> isn't it? You know, for the ones that have um, followed the racing. Yeah, clearly not a good design. So don't copy. It's <laughs> But how funny that both Marty, who, who Johnson who has a sister ship, that, that obviously built uh, mine and his boats, um, you know, in combined effort nine yep. years ago, but how funny that both of them broke on the same day uh, roughly, you know, 10 minutes apart. Because, because my theory was, oh, you know, boats the same age, launch about the same age, bolts is fatigued. Look, I have... Because a, most people don't change this, don't service, especially older boats and people that are mid-pack and backpack, they don't service their boats by changing yes. at all. Look, things. to be honest, I've actually done the, done the work. My boat got a full birthday about three months ago, full respray, um, all new fittings, new bolts, trams. Apparently got a hangover as well. Got a hangover too, exactly. So, but yeah, you know, it was all new. But I think um, what people want them to realise, and I mean, if you forgot, I did wrap myself around the top mark the day before. <laughs> when I well, was, what was that? When I, well, of course, the pilot, you know. But, you know, I underlaid the top mark and I was doing quite well in that race. I think I would have been fourth around the top mark or something. Um, caught the rudder on the, um, the mark rope. And there is a chance that they might have, they might have um, cracked it the day before. So, yeah. Just to wrap up, sort of talking about the world, anything else that you want to share? 
In other worlds? Not a lot. I think I think it was fairly. Um, there was no big surprises. I think. I think the way the placings were at the end was sort of what we expected um, coming through here. So uh, that awesome place to sail, and I think um, you know the Mount Space Sailing Club race committee and um, the organising committee, um, absolutely amazing. You know, great spot, very well run, great launching, great rigging, filling up the spear. You know, awesome event. Cool. So I think what we'll do is we'll um, wrap up the first show back in 2020 and we'll call it there. Sure.